And tonight we're going to talk about the basics. Um, you know, a lot of times we do not talk about the basics. Uh, yeah, I'll move back in screen, Bobby. It's all right. Uh, we're just going to cover three areas, but how we're going to cover them is going to take in a little bit more than just what the topic headings are. But you know, these are uh, these are the big three, um, if you will. Uh, you know, at one time uh, with our neighbors in the denominations, uh, you know, while these were still the big three, uh, there were a lot of other points that we could agree on. As time has gone on, these are the big three just even to get along with some of those that have the same name on the building as us. Uh, we understand it's not the name on the building that makes you the Lord's church. It's whether or not you're in agreement with what the Word of God says, what God says makes you His church. And so the place where we get that, first and foremost, is from the Bible. And we want to affirm, and if you have a question as we're going through, by all means, uh, raise your hand. That's why I've only got three points up here. I was going to have six, but I, we, I switched to three. Um, so if you have a question, by all means, uh, you know, ask the question on topic and... We'll try and answer it, but the first thing to understand is that the Scripture is from God and it's not from man. Uh, if I could get a volunteer, uh, say, Brother Adrian, would you mind reading 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21? 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Okay. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Alright. So the Word of God there says that no prophecy of Scripture comes from private interpretation. It doesn't originate within man, and it doesn't derive its meaning from humans. The meaning is from God and the origin is from God. And it's a fascinating thing that Peter says that about Scripture and prophecy in time of old because when you come over to 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 15 and 16, and if you've got those, Adrian, if you'll read those. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Now, what does he just say in that about Paul's writing? See, when someone says, well, there's a difference between Jesus and Paul. No, there's not. Everything that Paul had did not originate within Paul. Peter laid the definition of what constitutes Scripture. It's holy men of God being moved by the Holy Ghost to write those things down. And he says Paul's writings are Scriptures. And they'll twist what Paul says just like they will the other Scriptures. And so it's, and you say, yes, but he says it's Paul. And we've talked about this before. Uh, we've got the Bible written over about a 1600 year period by about 40 to 44 different people. There is one thought and one mind that runs all the way through it, even though there is the flavor of 40 different personalities that come through on each page. Uh, it's very easy to tell the difference between Paul and, say, John, or Paul and uh, uh, David because there's a difference in personality. Uh, Paul very well educated, but the writer of Hebrews is even more well educated. Uh, the Gospel of Mark in Greek is very choppy. It's not refined Greek. But the message, what? It fits right there with that block of the rest of the Bible and ties into that one mind of 1600 years. It's from God and not man. From God and not man. And each word is exactly what God wanted. Each word's exactly what God wanted. Uh, its purpose 
Uh, and what I would say to you on, it's, it, each word's exactly what God wanted. You remember I referenced Galatians 3 this morning, that he said, He did not say unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed as of one which is Christ. The whole argument of the Messiah in the book of Galatians is based on one letter. Seed or seeds. How precise is the word of God? Down to one letter. So when Jesus says not one jot or one tittle, that's how precise. Uh, one word. Thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt not surely die. So one letter and one word is how precise the scripture comes down to. It's purpose. Some people misunderstand what the purpose of Scripture is. Scripture is not here to justify what we believe. Okay? And you say, well, Brother Brian, we wouldn't do that. Sometimes, though, we might. You know? Uh, years ago, brethren were very fond of setting up straw man arguments. Who knows what a straw man argument is? Well, it's weak. It's a false argument. It's a weak argument. It's what you do, and I mean, politicians like to do this a lot. You take the rough tenets of what your opponent believes, and you set up the weakest part of their system of belief, and then you hit it with your hardest arguments, and you blow it out of the water. That's called defeating a straw man. Well, anybody can defeat a straw man. And so, you know, brethren wanted to say, well, our neighbors are wrong on this, and they would pick the worst part of the opponent's arguments, and they would demolish those. Well, that's not the purpose of Scripture. What does the Scripture say its own purpose is? Now, Bobby, read us that if you've got it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, thoroughly or truly? Thoroughly. Okay. See, so what's the difference? One's the Cambridge and one's the Oxford. I'll let you search it out to figure out which one's which. Um, truly furnished. The goal of Scripture is to equip us for good works. How do we know that our good works are right? <coughs> because they're agreeable with the doctrine. They've been tested. They've been corrected. And they've been tested one more time. <clears throat> most people believe that they are going to heaven because they believe the right thing belief is half of it Jesus said the father seeks those who worship him how in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. let's go over to 1 John chapter 3 real quick want to read oh, 1 John 3 16 through 19 hereby perceived we love start over hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren but who so faith this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his vows of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. All right, so what does he say the issue is there? What are we supposed to manifest? Last, the last clause of verse 18. How do we love? When, well, you know, with our works. And deed yeah, in deed and in truth. It's easy to say. You know? And so, and your other verse to tie in to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is James chapter 1. He says what? Don't just be hearers of the word, but doers. And then chapter 2 he says what? Faith without works is just like the body without the spirit is dead. And so, the purpose of the Bible, while, while it does have a purpose to make sure we believe the right thing, 
Can you believe everything right and still not do it? Yes. Yes. And this is the challenge that we have, is that we spend so much time making sure we believe the right thing that we don't put equal amount of time in doing the right thing. Our works don't tie up with our beliefs in terms of volume and activity, just overall as, as a generic principle. The position of Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a chicken egg question. We've answered this before, but it's good to reaffirm it. The position of Scripture. Verse 14, actually, uh, 1 Timothy 3, he says to Timothy, I've written these things to you, hoping to come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtst to behave in thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. On the one hand, does Scripture support the church? But at the same time, what is the ground and the, and the support system of the truth that the Scripture contains? No. What's the Scripture say? No. Let's read it again. If I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, and the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. And here's why this is important to establish. Courtesy of John Calvin, Calvin was the one who really pushed this thing about everybody can have their own private interpretation. Martin Luther didn't even do that. Calvin said, when you're saved, you'll get the Holy Spirit and He'll personally illuminate all of the Scripture for you that you need. And you don't need anybody else to tell you. And you'll get it. And you'll get it. And everybody will have their own personal, private, Holy Spirit-guided interpretation of the Scripture. What's the problem with that? It's different. They're not the same. It can be different. Okay. Can my spirit deceive myself? So who has to help keep me in check? The church, with the Word of God, makes sure what? That I stay within the Word of God. That what I preach and what I teach and what I do and what I believe is in agreement with what, what the truth is. Uh, we've got neighbors that now say baptism in the New Testament was not water baptism. Well, that's insane because even their own people for the first 300 years of their denomination, they all said, baptism in the New Testament is water baptism. If the doctrine was practiced by the church and a doctrine is recorded in the Bible, but someone gets a revelation from the Holy Spirit that the last 2,000 years of everyone's been wrong, What's the only thing to keep people in check? Well, it's the job of the church to be the pillar and the support of truth. And so when someone said, this is why, are the church fathers on equal par with the scripture? No. But are they closer to the apostles and the events in scripture to give us a clear understanding of what the apostles' doctrine was? Yes. And from that sense. Now, what's the best interpreter of Scripture? Scripture. Scripture. If Scripture interprets itself, does it matter what anybody else says it says? No. No. So if the book of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 and says this is about Jesus, it doesn't matter how fluent you are in Hebrew. What? The Holy Spirit already interpreted the Holy Spirit. And if you and I disagree with the Holy Spirit about the Holy Spirit's interpretation of what the Holy Spirit said, who's probably wrong? The Holy Spirit or us? Yeah. We are subservient to the Word. But the Word is that which is in the deposit of the church for all time. We aren't masters over it. 
It's the tool of the church for the purposes of the Holy Spirit in the world. Thoughts, comments, or questions? Clarification or confusion? Like I said, these are basics. These are basics. The other benefit to this is, and, and majority does not make right, but consensus should give you pause. If there's a hundred other people in the room that are all faithful in prayer and in study, and they all come to the Scripture and they all say the same thing, and you say something totally different, that's enough voice for you to sublimate yourself and seek further instruction. Okay? Uh, Cheryl and I were talking a while back about some folks over in Fort Worth, well, North Richmond Hills, that the dude said he was convicted 10 years prior about instrumental music in the worship, that God was for it, but he never preached it. If you're convicted about a doctrine of worship, how important was worship to Jesus? What did he say in John 4? The Father is what? The Father blanks those who will worship Him in spirit and truth. What? What's the S word there? Right. No? <coughs> Seeks. I want you to pause on that. God is actively hunting out people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. In other words, God's a hunter. Huh? Yeah. So if you were convicted on a doctrine about worship, and you held it for 10 years, and you taught a different doctrine? Boy, that's dangerous. It's one thing to come to a conclusion and spend 10 years trying to prove yourself wrong. It's a different thing to say that you believe that's the truth and then teach the opposite of it for 10 years. And you can tell me if this is a discussion for another yeah. time, but that's one of the things that I have a bit of a problem with because people, I think everybody that believes in God, believes in Jesus, is worshiping in their heart and in their mind. <coughs> but they might be wrong. Yes. And it's hard for me to speak in absolutes when it comes to some things. Yes. Uh, and you know what I'm saying yeah. is that does a person who worships in spirit and truth, even though what they are worshiping is wrong, where do they stand? And and that's and that's one of the six points that I dropped off. Ah. Um, we'll be and, for next week. Yeah, we might do basics part two and and have that one because here's the question, and this would be the question to answer in absolute from where I sit. Does the New Testament give us a pattern of New Testament worship? I believe the answer is yes. Do we have a clear picture of the overall worship of the first thousand years of the church and what they did? And again, the answer is yes. Is all of that available to someone who is actively also seeking the one who is seeking them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Therefore, to not be more active in working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, I think I think you're in that boat where you've condemned yourself. I, I, I believe that there's so many people that are brought up in a family that goes to such and such church, and they blindly um, seek out what is what they have been told from the from day one. And don't question it. And and there again, we come back to Matthew 7 and 13 and 14. Broad is the way, and broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and what? Many there are who are going in that way. But narrow is the way, and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life, and what? Few there be that even find it. And this, and this is why I say America is the most damned nation uh, in the history of humanity. 
How many Bibles have we got in here tonight? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We got at least 20. We got more Bibles in here than we got people. <coughs> On that day, what is God's excuse acceptance factor? <coughs> yeah, zero. Someone, well, it wasn't understandable. Since 1901, this thing has been translated in 20 different major English translations alone. <coughs> you can find it if you want. Uh, and, but that's, that's a good question, Bob. And uh, next week we'll do uh, worship as one of them. The church. The church is local. Now, we're not going to go through all these. Okay? How many churches are addressed at the beginning of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3? Seven. Seven. To the church at... Ephesus, to the church at Smyrna, to the church at Philadelphia. When Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he says to the church at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. When Paul addresses the churches of Galatia, okay, now Galatia was a region, okay, so you might say to the churches of West Texas. That's kind of the way you could look at that. But there is a local application of the church. This is where church autonomy comes in. The church at Ephesus can't tell the church at Philippi what time they meet. They can't say whether they should use a gold cup or a silver cup or a wood cup for the Lord's Supper for the Jews. They can't say, if you wear silk, you're going to hell. They can't say that. But if those elders in that church... Now, this is a problem we have in America. Someone says the elders of the church can't tell me that. Yes, they can. Now, let me pause. Is that rain? Oh, it's the coffee pot. Okay. So then I was like... Yeah, that'd be great if it's rain. Uh, if elders decide on something, and if you had a hand in putting them in, whether by silence and not opposing them, or verbally uh, by saying, yes, we want them, then you should trust that they have the wisdom and that they have your best interest at heart not to make uh, stuff in the local church hard to be born. Uh, if the elders wanted to, could they say all women who don't have hair that comes down to at least the middle of the shoulder blade shall wear veils? Yes. They're fully within their bounds. You say, well, I'm going to leave and go to a different church. Well, this is America. You can do that. Back in the first century, though, could you have done that? No. no. Okay. This is where you become a Christian. This is where you disciple. This is where, this is where everything in your Christian life really takes formation. Not these. Okay. Now, just so you know, there is no plan on the books unless Bob and Adrian have been meeting secretly to have women wearing veils. We don't have, I don't think, have we ever brought up that discussion, guys? I don't think, I don't, since I've been here, we haven't done that. Now, there are some churches of Christ where they wear veils. And if I lived in that area, you know, and, and if my, you know, family had short hair, and, they, and we went to those congregations, what? I would say we're going to wear veils. Why? Because that's what that church does. That's what those elders have decided, and that's that. If they say you're going to wear a three-piece suit to come in the doors and serve on the Lord's table, then fine, I'll wear a three-piece suit. Okay? It shouldn't be an issue, but for brethren, what? If that's a stumbling point for them, like it matters. This is where it all takes place, though. This is where the world wants you to think the church takes place. Church Universal. Someone read Hebrews 12, 23. <clears throat> to the General Assembly and Church 
of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay. To the general assembly, that has to do with the Jews, well with everybody under the old systems, and the church of the firstborn, whose names are what? Written in heaven. Registered or written in heaven. This is the church universal. Okay? Does the universal church discipline you? If you understand what discipline is. You know, Bobby, do you teach a class for the universal church? Or do you teach in the local church? Local. Uh, most of the people today, they say, well, the local church isn't what's talked about in the New Testament. It's the universal church. Because you can't know for sure if someone's really part of Jesus' real church. Well, what does that free you up then to do? Pick and choose. Pick and choose. Religion becomes a buffet ball. If I don't like it here, I can go over there because since I'm part of this mystical, invisible, universal <coughs> church, no matter where I go, Jesus has me covered. Now, is that true up to a point? Yeah. But why did the Lord appoint elders and deacons and evangelists and teachers and all that in the church? Let's go to Ephesians real quick. We'll read Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay. Now here's my question. If you are part of something universal, but you never submit to anything local, how can you be perfected? How can you do the work of ministry? Someone, well, I can do ministry wherever I go. Well, then who did you learn it from? Well, I just learn it because I read my Bible and Jesus just tells me in my heart what my ministry is today. Then why did God waste the time on evangelists and apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers? You know, I'll ignore the baby. <laughs> ignore the baby. Uh, yeah. He's happy. He's chewing on stuff. That takes place on the local level. It affects the church universal. If you are saved in the church local, are you automatically in the church universal? How long do you think you can survive, though, by faith if you're not grounded in a local church? And here's, here's all I'm going to say. We've had good people come to North Oak. They spend two to four weeks here trying us out to see what we can do for them. Because they were unhappy at their last church of Christ. And then they find out that Guess what? You're asking the wrong question, and here's our answer for your trial period. We aren't here to do anything for you. We're here to teach you the Word, <coughs> encourage you in the most precious and holy faith, and you know what? You're not a part of this church. Therefore, guess what? As elders, we have no obligation to you. We shepherd the flock that is among us. We don't shepherd someone else's rebellions who want to come in and say, how are you going to serve me? Stop and think about how arrogant that is. I wouldn't submit over here, and before I'm going to say that I will serve under you, I want you to tell me how you're going to serve me before I decide. And then when you say, we have no obligation to you, because what obligation do we have? If they're not of this flock, and they're not of that flock, then who is their shepherd? I say, well, Jesus is my shepherd. Well, Jesus said what? Right here. And you know what you see happen time and again? 
they bounce here, they bounce there, they fall out for anywhere from six to nine months, then they fall back in again for anywhere from three to six months. And after two or three times of that, you know what ends up happening to them? They just die. You say, well, you should reach out to them harder and more. No. No. And I, and I know that sounds harsh, but put it in a perspective of medicine. If you have someone that you love and that you care about, but they refuse to take their medicine, they refuse to eat their food, does there come a point in time where you've done all you can for them? Yes. Yes. And then they get to the point of death and they say, please give me medicine and please give me food. And so you give it to them, and each time they keep getting weaker and the medicine becomes less effective and the food becomes less